Hey everyone, it is George Kroos with another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. I actually have my good friend Ken Shelton on the podcast and uh, we were going to do this an hour ago, but we've been talking the entire time. So uh, we're starting this a little bit late, but it's going to be the same time for you. Uh, Ken is someone who I'm very close to. I've known for uh, a long period of time and luckily we connected um, through uh, social media, I think, and we've seen each other several times and um, have a lot of the same interests and passions. And it's someone I really look up to. And so, Ken, thank you so much for being here. And could you just share a little bit about, you know, who you are and your your journey in education? Yeah, no, first of all, thank you for having me. And I think it's important, first of all, for your audience to know that you and I have, have supported each other, followed each other, uh, I mean, I think we're going on over a decade, and mm-hmm. um, I just I just want to tell you how much I appreciate you and how much I love you dearly, and um, that's the that's the happy go lucky feel good part of this particular recording. But, <laughs> but in all seriousness, for everyone, you know, George is, has always been one of my favorites, and uh, I really wish we had more opportunity to speak together. So, um, you know, I mean, the bottom line for me is that you know my background. I worked in education uh, as a classroom teacher. Uh, for almost 20 years, and obviously I still work in education. Uh, I'm an independent advisor, consultant, speaker, trainer. Uh, I wear many hats. I like to say I'm a jack of many, jack of all trades, master of some. So, <laughs> yeah, and that we like we connected, and I, I've like every time um, you and I talk, it seems like we're gonna hey, like let's let's talk for like two minutes, and then like it's an <laughs> hour and a half later, whether it's in person, on the phone, and so. Um, I, I really loved in the work in, and you actually, you, you went to UCLA, right? Yes. So you said, and, and we just talked about that. And we are both actually um, from the Magic Johnson Lakers fans, right? And that's one of the, one of our connections. Cause I'm like a diehard and we like got to catch a Lakers game. But I, I, like, I love that you're, you're on the podcast and I've loved connecting with you for so many years, man. I, I know you made it better. And one of the things that I know that you're really passionate about is really talking about how we use technology to really open up doors for every single kid in our schools, right? And we were having the conversation earlier about how sometimes some of the things that we benefited from that they're closed to many of our kids. And this concept that I'm just fascinated by and has really stuck with me is this notion of techity that you have been talking about for a long time. So can you kind of talk about techity and and why it's so, especially right now, because like this is being recorded in the middle of May, but it's going to come out while, you know, we're still doing emergency room with teaching. So can you kind of dig into that concept? Yeah. So basically, it's ultimately looking at technology and equity and the intersectionality between the two. So I define equity as um, uh, providing, uh, excuse me, creating environments that are culturally responsive and culturally relevant uh, to support. I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. Merging educational technologies with environments that are culturally responsive and culturally relevant to provide students uh, with opportunity and access to learn essential skills. So the opportunity and access is how I define equity. And basically, you cannot have an equitable learning environment that is absent of technology. You think about what what it does as far as uh, opening doors, what it does as far as, again, the access, whether it's information, and then also opportunity, opportunities for learning, opportunities for voice, opportunities for uh, representations of learning. So, so ultimately, that intersectionality, I think, is critical for all of us. And, you know, you can see it. It's quite glaring when you see the discrepancy and the disparity between those that do have access versus those that don't. And then add the layers on how that access is being used, where, you know, in many cases, I, in fact, this has happened quite a bit, far, far more often than it should as I've seen in school districts where, let's say they predominantly serve a population of historically marginalized students. So black students, uh, Latinx students, uh, Asian students. Um, In many cases, the way technology is being used is strictly drill and kill versus in many of our wealthier suburban schools or wealthier schools in general where technology is used in what many, um, you know, subjective views would be as uh, creative activities or creative exercises. So um, you know, so for me, it's, it's looking at how can we uh, appropriately incorporate, uh, integrate and engage with technology, but being mindful of our cultural differences, the reasons why cultural identity is important in the curriculum, and how that technology can provide unfiltered and unfettered access to uh, stories that aren't within uh, the scope of the dominant culture. So like they, when I've, I've used this analogy before, and I've seen this happen 
um, a, a ton, right? Like if I was to become a principal of a school and I started there and I said, hey, um, we are going to, just because we could use the space better, we're gonna get rid of the library, right? We're gonna just turf it and we're gonna use it for different things. I would probably be there for maybe three to four days before I got fired, right? And that's something, because people are like, how dare you take that away from kids? You know, this is such an opportunity. But then a kid actually brings a device to a classroom that has more information than everything in that library. And not only more information coming in, there's more opportunity going out. And then like people don't even think twice about that, right? right. And it's like individualized and connected. And so like one of the things that, is happening right now is you see this that the schools have embraced um the what you're talking about the idea of how we use technology to really empower to like give ownership over your own voice and do this they seem to be i don't want to say they're doing fine right now but they seem to be better equipped to deal with some of the stuff that's happening because they've worked with kids to really see the power of this and the ones that have like said no you don't bring us to the door there's a struggle there and right. I, like, are you seeing any of that right now? Am I totally off here? So a couple of things. One is right now, it's interesting how many school districts were able to find all that money in the seat cushions of the sofa to be able to buy technology and get hotspots out to kids. That's okay. where it was. It was in the seat cushions. Yeah, the it was in the seat cushions. <laughs> That's right. um, so, you know, it, look, it, the best way I can describe it, even within what you're saying is, is, it's based on some recent readings that I've done around the idea that, you know, the, the old statement, you can't see the forest for the trees where, you know, again, mm -hmm. you know, aligned with that, it's like, well, you know, you need to look at, at systems, you need to look at it as both the forest and the trees. And so the reason why I say that is this, the individual trees are, let's say those are our students. So what are we doing to ensure access? And how do we guarantee that that access is unfettered, unfiltered, and unobstructed? So for example, a lot of the advising work and consulting work I've done with school districts and state departments of ed uh, here in the US uh, is around broadband access. Many of our urban areas and our rural areas do not have broadband access. And in fact, I know of quite a few teachers that teach in rural schools where they're lucky if they have a strong cell phone connection. Mm -hmm. So that, that, that eliminates the whole hotspot thing. Then if you look in the urban areas, it's how much does it cost to um, have internet access? And because it's not a utility here in the US, you, you, you have that disparity as far as just the base level access. So that's the systemic level. Then go into the individual component, like you said, where one, I mean, I know you and I are of like mind. One, I'm a staunch believer in libraries. In fact, I'll go even one step further. Every school, a library should be the center of learning of every mm -hmm. school, because that's the only room or building or part of the campus that it has democratized access. Every student can go into a library. And this is why I'm a big fan and supporter of our teacher librarian trends around, you know, what are the titles you have in the stacks? How diverse are those representations? And what are, what are you able to do to support teachers in getting those out to uh, the students in the first place? And it goes into another conversation you and I can have uh, maybe on another podcast is around the idea that every student's learning experience should be a mirror window and a sliding glass door. But, but back to your point, you're right. It's, if you talk about getting rid of something that is physical, tangible, and normalized for most of us, that's problematic. But because so many teachers don't understand, and, and, and let's be real, it's a control thing. If I have a child that comes to campus and they have their phone, and I've got to compete, keyword, for their attention with that phone, then I want to get rid of the phone so I don't have to do it. And my whole thing is, if you have the ability to leverage something that is normalized for today's kids, if they have the phone, if it's constantly with them, if it's tethered to them, why not say, okay, I want to encourage you to use that phone, but here's how I want you to use it. You know, it's kind of like, rather than remove it, why not teach the, or, or, or support the use of it that benefits you? And here's a true story. It was uh, uh, not too long ago, the AP exams, which again, another podcast episode for us to talk about that garbage. So the AP exam shifted to online because they can't do it in person. And AP exams by design are already inequitable because most, in many cases, and for, for your audience, there's a couple of things. One, here's how AP is inequitable. One, you have to have an AP teacher on campus. That AP teacher has to be certified. So now think about how many schools are in a position to hire a teacher 
and then financially support them becoming certified to teach the class where the primary purpose of the class is to take the exam that you also have to pay for. Now, wealthy families can also have their child take AP prep, the AP exam prep at, an, at a testing center. Do a Google map search for AP or SAT or ACT test prep centers and watch what happens in many of our cities. And yes, I will save you the search and tell you that you're gonna find those prep centers in specific zip codes and not in other zip codes. So now they did the exam because they had to do it online. And to the point you're making about the phone, I watched and I did a couple of searches on Google Trends. And if you want, I can even send you a screenshot in, uh, for the show notes. The query around, uh, for the AP calculus, the query around uh, integer coefficient, and there were like several other, I did like five different searches. There was a significant spike in that search query the minute that AP calculus exam started. And so I'm thinking like, okay, good on those kids because they know how to navigate within the game of the AP exams mm -hmm. to at least give them an opportunity to be successful. I also watched on social media where a lot of people were like, well, that's cheating, that's cheating, that's cheating. And I'm like, okay, so let me get this straight. If you have a team of doctors that's trying to cure cancer and they can start doing a bunch of searches and look up research from other doctors mm -hmm. in other parts of the world and say, okay, we've got this access to this and we're going to take what we know and combine it all and they find a cure for cancer. Are you going to accuse them of cheating? Or are you going to say you utilize the resources you had available to accomplish the, the goal that you set? And so in this context, I'm with you. It's like, no, you don't want to remove things or, or deny access. What you want to do is say, how can we better leverage the access that the school didn't have to pay for and that the school didn't provide, even though they should, so that kids have more opportun access and opportunity for information and for, to augment their learning. Yeah, like, like as, you're, as I'm listening to you and thinking about this, one of the things I know we're both adamant about is the, the presence of that technology is really important in every that kids have access to this, but that is not enough, right? So if you go to a school, they have every technology in the world, but they're not actually shifting their thinking and they're not shifting how they utilize this. And I think that one of the things, and maybe Ken, I don't know, I'm, I'm sure we are kind of on the same lines. It's not that when we talk about this idea of tech equity that you're sharing today, this isn't that every kid has the exact same thing. It's that kids have whatever they need to be successful. And that looks different for, for all of our kids. And so like, how, how, how would you actually, so like, let's say we got all the technology in place. We've got all these things. What are some of the shifts that you, you like, would you like to see in like what we, what we do with this? Right. You just basically did uh, another descriptor or defi definition of the difference between equality and equity. So equality, everyone has access. We give all the kids, uh, you know, a, a Chromebook. Equity is what resources do we have available that we can distribute on a as needed basis to ensure a pathway towards success for each individual student. So I think part of the shift in, in thinking that, it, that I've actually encouraged educators to do, even given what we're challenge with right now is, is, is twofold. One, be a curator of your learners. Do you even know what resources and access your students have, whether it's technology itself or any other resource that can help provide a pathway towards students being successful? And then second to that is, you know, we've heard it a lot. I've used the terms, you've heard it a lot, is a whole idea around individualized education. Not every student comes into a learning environment with the same experiences, with the same resources, with the same understanding. And so if we continue to do towards the middle, i.e. the standard, then you know there's just as much inequity as treating everyone differently as there is treating everyone the same. And so to me, technology can be used and should be used in a way that helps gain more information of what are the individualized needs of the students that are within the context of the learning environment and how can we use technology to or how can we leverage the technology to ensure that those needs are being met? I'll give you a prime example of that. So when I was in a classroom, one of my favorite classes that I had for most of my career was when I would get a class of uh, students that were identified as ELL or ESL. Um, and, and just for your audience, please be mindful of the fact that all of us are ELL at some point in our life. So there's a stigma attached to ELL students that we need to get rid of. All of us are ELL at some point in our life. Now, with that being said, 
one of the things that I noticed is that, you know, when you have ELL or ESL students, there obviously is some degree of a language restrictor. Well, guess how you can remove that barrier, the tech. So for me, one of the things that I used to always do is any type of instruction that I did or any type of, of, of let's say, project parameters that I would provide for the students, it would be in English and it would be in their language. See, now I'm making it accessible. Now, in many cases, I couldn't speak their language. I mean, I'm, I'm decent with Spanish and, and several other languages, Italian and French, but, but not fluent. But my whole point is that because of using that technology, you know, think in terms of design for inclusion. I'm including, I'm being inclusive of the background of those students by saying I'm providing it in English, but I'm also providing it in your language, which means now more accessible. That can't happen without technology. And they, like, as you're, as you're going through this, like, one of the things that I say to people all the time is that some of our kids... They are not bad at science. They are bad at writing about their understanding of science. Those are two totally different things. Completely. And sometimes when we are assessing them and talking about that, like even the notion of kids, um, like t having kids um, do science and they're like, oh yeah, but you lost this for grammar and you lost, it. I'm like, but that's not what you're assessing. You're assessing the understanding of science. And, ah. and like, we actually, we actually um, in our school district that I was uh, in Parkland, years ago, we really tried to get people to think about um, like how some of those um, grading procedures that probably, you know, uh, I don't know if this is a Canadian thing or it's an everywhere thing, but like I used to be graded for attitude, right? Like yeah. you lose marks for attitude. Here too. Right. And, and, and so I actually remember this one time I like, so we do a lot of these practices and Ken and I were talking about this before. A lot of stuff that we talk about, we talk about it different than we would have, you know, when we first started teaching. And we know everyone's on a different space. And, and when I actually, I remember this one time, um, I actually had a student who like, I did the same thing my teachers did, like, hey, here's this percentage for, you know, what you know, here's your homework percentage, here's your attitude percentage, right? And the one teacher or the one parent said like, hey, I noticed my daughter actually has a, a really bad attitude mark in your class like you she i'm like well you know like she's very like rude to me and this and then she said well she actually doesn't have that in any other class <laughs> like everyone else her attitude and i'm like oh maybe it's me right like see and that's the thing is that sometimes those like in, like it's reality is that sometimes especially at the older level we can have personality conflicts with our kids but now those personality conflicts are actually deciding the grade of the kid of the understanding right. Yeah. And that there's something wrong with that. And the, the, the one thing you reminded me of, and I don't know if you could kind of expand on this. One of the things I've been saying for years is like, would you want to be a learner in your own classroom? And when I say that, I don't say it from the perspective of like, would George want to be a George learner in his classroom? It's actually, you need to understand the kids in front of you and understand what their experiences are and what works for them, not maybe what worked for you as a kid when you were in school. Exactly. So how do you help people kind of like go through that process of like really like understanding from the perspective of their students what that learning looks like? So you touched on uh, one of the other areas of equity, um, and it's something that I talk about. Um, I'm not talking about a whole lot more now, so I'm, I'm not going to be silent on this. And that is uh, learning culture. And, or, and ultimately, if you think in terms of schools or school districts, it's organizational culture. So when I was in school, you did get the, um, you got your letter grade and then you had like, um, they didn't call, it was like behavior right. and there was something else. And it was, uh, you either got outstanding, satisfactory, or unsatisfactory. And then when you think in terms of anything that is a byproduct of a human condition, there's a subjective assessment applied to it. And unless that comes with anti-bias and anti-racist training, you are going to apply your um, hierarchical value on what another student does. And so, and, and the reason why I say that is because I know for a fact at my last school, in fact, I, 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 I share the story and I mean, we're doing, we're gonna run over time, but I'm gonna share this story. We, I told you that before. Yeah, but it's all good. <laughs> I, I, I don't get enough time with you, as you know already anyway, and your audience is going to see this recording. Like I said earlier, I love George. So <laughs> I'm going to take what I can get. Um, 
But the reason why I'm saying that is because I'll give you an example of something that happened at my last school and how it ties in with what you're saying. And why I say that, that ultimately the culture of your, your classroom and your school is a larger predictor of the success of students than anything else. So at my last school, I had a student um, who would come to school and his hair was braided. So um, just to give everyone the picture, my last school was a Title I school. I I was the only African-American male teacher there, which was my whole career in the Los Angeles High School District, only African-American teacher there. And the student population, as far as African-American goes, was right around 15%. And the Latinx population was probably right around 50%, 55%. Anyway, so the student's coming in, got his hair braided. And I'm giving a hard time. It's like, you know, you keep coming in class with your hair braided. I'm like, are you trying to send me a message? You know, at one point I did have hair. That's not cool with stuff. And I, he and I, uh, you got along very, very well. And, and quite frankly, to the point you just made about, would you want to be, uh, you know, a learner in your own classroom, you know, for your audience, one, I greet the students out the door every day, every class period. Mm -hmm. Yes, you can get up behind your desk and do it. It's not that hard. Okay. And now there's peer reviewed published research that supports the overall disposition of a student increases in a positive capacity when they're greeted at the door by the teacher. Mm -hmm. So greet them at the door by your correctly pronounced first name. Okay, not what someone else has told you makes it easier for them to pronounce. If I, and I would tell the students, look, if I can't pronounce your name correctly, correct me and I'll get it, mm -hmm. period. Okay, because what happens is when you, when you don't use a student's correct first name, you already have stripped them of some element of their own personal identity, which means that now every time they go into that class, in the back of their mind or in the forefront of their mind, it's, well, the teacher won't even say me by my name. So if they won't use my correct name, then how the heck else are they going to support me? Or are they even going to see me in class in the first place? Now, with that being said, come into class. So student coming to class, I'm giving a hard time doing this. And I finally said, look, you know what? One of these days you should let your hair out and comb it out. I want to see the fro. I want to see how, how much, how much you really got going there. Or are you, do you have a weed? And it was my way of teasing him. He's like, no, nah, Mr. Shell. No, no, no. So maybe about a week later, he comes to school has a hair and an afro and he and, and I said okay and of course he's popular and so all the kids are like oh that's bad you got an afro that's cool you look cool you the man blah 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 you know and he's you know all these positive affirmations from his classmates and so then he comes to class and you know I give him a high five and I'm like okay so now I have a couple questions for you where's your pick and he's like oh that's in my pocket I'm like is it metal and he's like yeah I'm like dude it's gonna put a hole in your pocket I'm like I grew up, I had a pick that had a fist on it. And I used to put it in my hair and you just leave it right there and it just kind of sits there. That's where you store it. And so he did that. Later that day, I got a call from the dean and the dean says, you know, the student is in my office and is crying and is asking me to come and if he can come and see you. Now, the dean was a very good friend of mine. He still is. And so then I'm like, okay, yeah, send him, send him down to me. So he comes to me and he explains that, he explains what happened. I said, tell me what happened. Now, part of the reason to the point you're making as far as like attitude and culture is I already had built in a degree of a trust factor with, mm -hmm. with all of my students that there are things that you can trust in me and communicate with me that my default response is always going to be, how can I support you? And then how can we learn from this together? They, I had already established that credibility at that school because I had been there long enough and had enough interaction with enough students. So he explains to me that he was walking down the hallway and another teacher yelled at him, teacher he doesn't have, and he's going to a class that's all the way down the hallway, yells at him and tells him that it's inappropriate for him to have the comb out of his hair and he needs to take it out. And so then he responded in a way with his teacher saying, you know, basically like, you're not my teacher and GFY. <laughs> and so, of course, what does that teacher do? The teacher, the power struggle, the teacher basically calls his teacher and says, I've written a referral and he needs to go to the dean, call the dean and demand that he get suspended. And so then of course he, he requested to come and speak to me. And so I talked to him and stuff. But, but, but the reason why I'm sharing that to the point you were just making is like, one, that teacher applied what she thought was an appropriate cultural assessment that she was not only completely wrong, she never had examined her own biases. She never had examined her own racism. And then I can only think that if there were another African-American male student who were going into that class and that was their teacher, what kind of trauma are they dealing with on a daily basis mm -hmm. when you had something like that happen? And so for your audience and to your question, when you think in terms of, would you wanna be in a, a, a learner in your own classroom or your own school, 
the question I would always ask is, how inclusive are you? Are, are all of your students seen and heard? And are their needs being met? Because if you don't have that, then you already have a disparity as far as a pathway towards achievement and success. And, and I would argue with anyone that if you have students that know that they're seen and they're heard, and then you apply your high expectations to those students, they're more likely to rise up to the occasions of the challenge because they know that you're gonna support them. And then quite frankly, what I used to always tell my students, my default, no matter what, I got your back. That's my default. It took me like uh, about five seconds to know what GFY meant. <laughs> I was like, what? Have a great fun here. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, that's what that means. Well, they, when, so I, like, I remember, you know, the, the, the things that you're talking about, I spent, and really it's going to sound weird at first, but I spent so much time as a teacher, as a vice principal, as a principal in the hallways, hanging out with kids, having conversations and just, you know, seeing who they were kind of like just getting to know them. And I would do that time and people like would say to me, well, how do you have like time for that? Because later when something goes wrong, I'm not spending hours trying to gain trust with them. I'm not like having to do this other, like all these other things. And like the, the, the actually uh, I wrote about um, innovate at the box, exactly what you said. And so I can back you up on it simply is greeting a kid at the doorway before they went is actually shown to improve academics over and over again. And it's so do I want to spend 10 minutes at the beginning of the class, greeting kids, talking to them, you know, in this really kind of positive way, or would you rather spend that 10 minutes dealing with, you know, classroom management, all this other stuff, you know, doing this. And I, because that, that 10 minutes where I'm being reactive to this is going to add like years to my life through this process. Right. And like, it's just kind of spending that time to like understand who your kids are. And I think that's the, the, was the whole premise of like, would you want to be a learner in your classroom? That means you have to understand the learners you're serving and, you know, just the, the, the variance and the, exactly. the, the, the one, so one question I used to ask, and I want your feedback on this. So I used to ask this in an interview. So I'd say like, so two kids, same day, um, same conversation uh, or same, you know, same first time. They both start a fight. They're in the same grade, two different people. Is their like uh, consequence the same? And, and if you said yes, I'd be like, like, so, so, okay, what about this? What about this? What about this? There's so many variants on this and like how, what you know about your kids, uh, this and like what they need at that time. Right. And really that to me was, that was work, but sometimes it, it was like, okay, hey, if this kid does these things, I want to know exactly what punishment A is and, and punishment B. But it was like, no, you got to know the kid. Like, you got to know because part of it, understand, you know, when, they, when they've wronged someone else, yeah, of course, we got to deal with that too. But also, like, the whole purpose is to help the kid. It's not to get a pound of flesh, right? Like. No. No, and what you're talking about is aligned with a, a restorative practice mentality, um, is, is the reaction is supportive and informative, not punitive. Mm -hmm. And, and even, even with that, I mean, you and I have got, we got lots of stories we could do on this one. Mm -hmm. I remember, so for your audience, I think it's important for me to be humble and say that I did not get it right when I started. I made lots and lots of mistakes. Yep. Um, I, I still, to this day, um, have a momentary pause in thinking how much damage did I potentially cause early in my career because I basically was teaching and had a classroom environment that was a byproduct of the way I was trained to teach, which a lot of it was wrong. And that's why I tell educators, a lot of it, you got to unlearn, um, mm -hmm. you know, the whole classroom management, are you managing behavior or are you building in expectations? And then what happens when a behavior is not aligned with your expectations, i.e. a student exhibits an unexpected behavior. And what I found, to your point, is a lot of the challenges with students that could have taken hours and hours and hours of the referral, of the meeting, of the phone call, of this, of that, of this, of that, and then you begin that vicious disciplinary cycle that in some cases literally just rolls over a lot of the kids, which, you know, at least 
for sure here in California, but in a lot of states, depending on how the student is, that becomes a catalyst for the school to prison pipeline, by the way, as well. Now, with that being said, I remember having situations with students where they'd come into class, and again, going back to you, because I'm greeting them, I can see the nonverbal communication that they're just, uh, um, com uh, that, that I, I'm, I'm observing their nonverbal communication to where I know if a student didn't get any sleep the night before, I know if a student, something's going on, and I can be responsive to it, where I remember one student um, came into class and was like, you know, and I'm like, you know, you good, you good? And the student was like, hey, I'm fine. And I'm like, I know he's not. Right. And then probably about, maybe honestly, about five to 10 minutes into class, he gets up and flips his chair. And so for me, the way I was trained, the reaction is you yell at him, you write a referral, you send him to the dean, you call the parents, he was disrupted, he was this, that, blah, 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 blah. Instead, I'm like, let's step outside, let me holler at you for a minute. And of course, that was the way I would speak to many of my students because again, it's, it's my whole thing where I caution teachers around tone policing. There's ways to communicate in the different environments. And the key for us is to understand what environment am I in and what's the most effective way to communicate? You know, it's not, not placing a hierarchy on the language we use. But I remember I stepped outside and I'm like, I knew something was wrong when he walked in. Tell me what's going on. Tell me what I can do to help you. And of course, a student starts crying and he tells me that his older sibling had uh, just been arrested uh, and falsely accused of a crime. And he didn't know what to do. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay, so here's what we can do. One, why don't you come and hang out with me? You know, you don't have to, don't worry about the work today because ultimately what, what good it would be, what good would it do for me to tell that child, okay, well, you know what? You need to focus and get your work done. That done, it's not going to happen. You think the kid's <laughs> going to care about the project we're doing and his older brother just got arrested? Like, come on. So what I did is I had him sit next to me and I told the whole class, I said, look, you know what? We got this covered. You all do your thing. We're good. We're good. Uh, and then ultimately he just shared with me, I was frustrated because, you know, um, it's happened to other relatives before where they've been falsely accused. And of course, because I already knew this student, I knew where he lived and I knew that that was a, a, a highly policed area. Um, and, and I know that, that ultimately his, his older brother was released because there was no evidence again, falsely accused. But I will tell you that he was in the seventh grade and then basically demanded from the counselor. Now this counselor, I had a good relationship with to have me as a teacher in the eighth grade. And before he left to go on to high school, I remember he said, you know what, Mr. Sheldon, I knew you were the real deal when you didn't get on my case about the situation with my brother. And he's just like, I, I just, I just want to thank you. You're the best teacher I've ever had. And, and I was just like, look, you know what? I'm doing my job. I appreciate the feedback. I said, what, what I hope that you will be able to do at some point is find a valuable human resource that you can articulate how you're thinking and how you're feeling. Because unfortunately, I can't be your teacher for the rest of your life. But but, but hopefully what we were able to do together and then you observe me with your other classmates, hopefully that will serve you well in your future relationships, maybe your future marriage. And then if you become a parent, the way that you um, raise your kids as well. But, but again, to your point, it still goes back to taking that time to have a deeper understanding of, of, of your students and of what their needs are. That few minutes now saves hours and hours and hours of work and potential trauma later. Uh, I, I'm, I'm listening to you and I was reminded like when I was a principal, I remember one student um, was at my school and he had a history of like suspensions, all this, and then he ended up in my school. And he had, I can't remember what he had done, but I remember specifically, I'm, I told him, I'm like, look, we're gonna, I'm gonna suspend you uh, for five days. And I remember this specifically. He's like, so I got at home? I'm like, no. You're going to be in my office for five days. It's going to be me and you for five days. He's like, what? I'm like, no, you and I are going to, we're going to hang out. We're going to be there. And actually, so this kid, so he was doing his work. I would do my work. I'd have to go do stuff. But he was in my office, right? But we built this bond and this yeah. connection. And one of the things that I had known is this kid had, um, he had family that had left, right? And what I was doing there is like, I'm not leaving you. Like, I'm here. Yeah. Never ended up in my office ever again. Like not never, sorry. He was in my office all the time, but never ended up in my office for trouble. For trouble. Yeah. A very different thing. Right. And I like that sometimes, right. Like that just having the connection. Right. And we did this and 
he knew that hey, I was totally disappointed in what he had done. And I remember that specifically, but I st I'm there, right? Because like, come on, Ken, you and I both grow up. We've shared a lot of stories that we wouldn't share in the podcast. We did have done stupid things in our lives too. And having that understanding and sharing that with the kid is like, yeah, like we, we've turned out okay. We've all done dumb things. We all grow through this process, right? W one of the things, and I'm just curious, I'm actually curious about something very specific and I want your take on it because as I'm listening to you, one of the things that we really want to do is ensure that every kid has the opportunity to be successful, right? And you've used that term successful. And I actually always have gone, when I talk about success, I always say in a way that is meaningful to the kid, to the kid. Not, not success based on, on what you deem as successful. It's really, that's something like anyone listening to this podcast right now, you could deem yourself successful, but you could actually have different uh, values to what that looks like. Right. So I'm going to ask you something really specific and I just thought about it. So what do you think, about when you go to a school and I, I don't know if I know that you work with a lot of schools and they have the where and I'm not going to give my opinion on this I want to hear what you have to say first when they have like this is where I went to college outside every teacher's door yeah um so a couple of things with that one is I identify success with school as the following pure and simple when a student walks across the stage, do they have options? Right. That's it. Because we're seeing now, and I'm a staunch advocate in the CTE world, by the way, as well. I have a, a certification here in California in career and technical education, is that students should have options. Not every student is going to go to college. Not every student should go to college. Not every student should have to go to college. There's a whole separate realm of that as far as, um, unless and until college becomes economically accessible, uh, universally, then what you're doing is you're perpetuating a hierarchy already, or you're coercing and quite frankly, uh, uh, um, what I would say, indoctrinating students in that the only pathway is college, and if they can't afford it, then take out loans, which means they're going to be indebted for most of the rest of their adult life, which I think is grossly irresponsible. So when teachers have that outside their door, I think that there, there's, I, I think it's, it's an incomplete narrative, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Here's where I went to college. Okay, great. But why did you go to college? Why did you choose that college? Why did you choose this career? And if you couldn't go to college, did you have other options to do? Like provide more depth and breadth to what you're, you're putting on display. It's, it's, it's the equivalent of window dressing. You know, we walk past a store and we see the clothes uh, in, the, in the window. But when you go in the store, you got a whole bunch of other clothes there. It's not just what's mm -hmm. in the window. So there's more depth to that. Uh, and, and that's why, again, I mean, for me, it's like, what options do the kids have? Are you, uh, you know, are you pushing for uh, CTE programs? Are you pushing for the arts? Are you pushing for the academia? All those things. And yeah, success is subjective. You know, I mean, I, I'm going to write up a thing about eventually about grades. I mean, I, I despise grades. You're using a letter to represent the totality of learning that is subjective. And you know this, you're an administrator. I go into one class as a student. Uh, and I have an A. I go into the exact same subject in a different class, and I have a completely different grade. Uh, and you're starting to see a big pushback around looking at how we assess learning that isn't strictly tied to a specific letter. But with that being said, yes, success is going to be different. And anyone who says, well, it should be like this, the minute you standardize it by design, it's inequitable. Well, they, so, they, sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. Well, the, the one reason that it's always kind of bothered me a little bit. And I think the reasoning why, and, and that's what I wanted to ask you. I like the idea of like sharing that complete story, but I don't know. Again, um, I grew up in small town, Canada. You grew up in LA, which is very different, right? Very, very different um, from where we grew up. But I don't know if this is similar. The basically we were, it was kind of, it wasn't outright said, but it was kind of hinted at, like, if you do not go to college, you're a loser. Like, right. that's what it was. And it's that's like, that's I know right. a lot of people that have not went to like a university college. Um, they went to some, you know, different types of, you know, academic institutions, but not got a degree or whatever. And some that haven't, that are very happy, very successful in a way that's meaningful to them. 
And so like, it just, there's a little bit of that. It creates this, not the pressure of going to college. Like, like I like that you said options, but it's the pressure. If you don't go to college, then yeah, somehow correct. you failed. Yeah. It, it is a, it is an indirect way of, of dehumanizing. Uh, and then also I'll, I'll add that, you know, so for example, in my last school, I didn't put that out on outside my door. Mm -hmm. I was like, I'm not going to advertise this. My students will get to know me and then they can Google my name if they want, but they'll know right. where I went to college because you know, I'm, I'm a brewing through and through, but when I've gone on, on campuses and schools and I've seen that, I've kind of seen this, this, I would say unintended, which I don't care what people's intentions are. I care what the actions and reactions are, but unintended consequence of placing a hierarchy as to who went to college and where they went to college. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, well, this teacher only went to blank college, but that teacher went to blank university. Like, as if, again, this hierarchy, and it's like, no. I'm representing where I went to school, but again, incomplete narratives. I, I, I just don't, to me, I think a college going culture creates, uh, it can perpetuate both an economic, um, well, really an economic and even quite frankly, a racial hierarchy on campus, whether you intend it to or not, because only certain people can go to college, only certain people can afford to go to college, and, and until, a lesson until, which I'm hopeful it will happen, a lesson until they dismantle those ridiculous standardized tests, those are culturally biased. So you have both a, a, a culture hierarchy and an economic hierarchy that you're perpetuating, instead of saying, you know what, by the time you cross the stage, you will have options. And further to that point, when it comes to success, I always tell school leaders, you want to, want to gauge the success of your school or your district? Conduct an exit interview of every student that's dropped out mm -hmm. or every student that's now incarcerated. And they'll tell you. They'll tell you exactly how the system failed them, not they failed themselves. The, the, one, of the, one of the things that um, to this day drives me crazy is when we have like we get student feedback on stuff or we have like a student conference and we're going to hear about school. And a lot of times we sell, we send kids that do academically well. Oh yeah. Like, oh yeah. They're cherry picked. I, I love it. I love it. It's perfect the way it is. Right. And really kind of having those conversations like, Hey, why, why did you not want to be in school? And um, some of the, some of the school districts I've worked with, they have done an amazing job that they've actually said, here's why your school didn't like, they actually, um, you know, left that high school before getting their degree or their, or their diploma. And, here's why your school didn't work for me. And here's, here's what I did and what did work for me. Mm -hmm. And then we would actually talk about could, could what that student just said worked in that situation actually not apply in your high school. Can we make some of those things relevant? Right. And the one, the one, I remember the one time it was in uh, just West Dallas in Milwaukee, DJ Raymer, who I've had on the podcast, incredible leader. We had this conversation and they talked about, this we had students who had you know um, had, had left the school, and the one thing that came back to it, and as you said earlier, was really like that. Like the the teacher knew me. Um, one of the students I remember distinctly said, um, "I had I had suicidal thoughts basically for three years of my high school life, and the thing that actually kept me alive was a teacher who never taught me one day in the class ever, uh, one day of like one day in my history of that high school." actually acknowledged me by my name, which you mentioned earlier, and said hello to me every morning. And that was actually what kept me alive. And I'll, I'll never forget that story because I've talked about how, like one of the things that I've, I, I just not a big fan of is like every kid needs at least one adult that's crazy with them. And I'm like, one? Are you kidding me? Like yeah, what? All of them. Right, all, all, like everyone, right? Like, and it should be all of us too. Now, I want it to be at least one, but if you think about one over a 12-year period, all of the different classes, and I can only go to that one person, you know, so like it's really look, talking about, you know, how we each are advocates for our kids, how we go out of those, out of our way to like build those connections in the hallway. And you, like a lot of the students I connected with that I never taught that, you know, really appreciated me they actually helped me a lot of times with kids that were in my classroom because they had a credibility with them. Yeah, yeah it, exactly. Right. Now, you know, it, look, the bottom line is 
with this. And you and I, what a shock. You and I are in, in full agreement and full alignment. Um, I'm going to share this, share this with you. I don't think I've shared this part with you that I, I now include uh, in one of my talks. And it's the question that I ask all school leaders whenever I do uh, my leadership workshops. Is I, I, I basically say, I want, we're going we're gonna to do an assessment of, uh, of a child's experience in your school or in your district. And we're going to gauge it based on the answer to the following question. And so uh, the phrase is Esarian uh, Nakera, which is the Ma'a language. It's the language that the uh, Maasai tribe in Kenya uses. And they use that, they ask that question as a basis for the health of the community uh, and then everything that they do. And Esarian Nakera translated into English loosely translates to the question of, and how are the children? And ideally, they answer it by saying the children are well. Now, if you were to ask that in classrooms or in schools right now, I'm not convinced that everyone, every child, that, that everyone could respond with um, a high degree of certainty saying, and their children are well. And so for me, the default should always be, what are we doing to meet the needs of the kids? You know, you talk, uh, you know, you hear it now a lot around social and emotional learning. And uh, a lot of, uh, of folks are looking for uh, the, the quick fix. I need this app or I need this app, this program to do it. And, um, and I even share this as well, that no social and emotional learning program is effective or sustainable if it doesn't address the needs and supports of the adults in the buildings, to your point. And that means, and, and here's one, think about all the different touch points a student can have on campus. The bus driver, if they ride the bus, mm -hmm. the office, if they walk through the front, the counselors, the maintenance staff, the, the cafeteria staff, the teachers, the TAs, all of the administrators, all that. How many touch points? So it's got to address the adults in the building. It has to include ongoing professional development support that is anti-bias and anti-racist because you have to examine your own biases. Otherwise, you are going to have thinking gaps that are going to be trauma-inducing. And the worst part is, you know, which you and I have shared a little bit in this podcast, is what happens if you don't know? Right. Uh, and then it has to be anti-racist as well because there, there is a correlation between the two, intersectionality between the two. And then the third one, to the point that you and I have just shared in our stories, is uh, student agency and student empowerment. Because, you know, I ask people, I'm like, you know, if students are not doing well on campus on a social and emotional level, first of all, we can agree that they aren't learning. And second of all, how do you know? Do you have to ask or have you created mechanisms for that to be communicated to you? Ideally, it's a two-way communicative uh, uh, relationship in that capacity. So... You know, I think if anything, uh, if your audience from from this segment of, of us chatting, I hope that, you know, when when things return to any degree of normalcy, which I hope they don't return to what they were, by the way, um, I hope that that the default will be, am I meeting the needs on a social and emotional level of my students before I engage in any degree of the curriculum? Uh, the, the other thing, too, and I would add to about the touch points, because I think that's really like it's every adult they interact with is the representation in the school. So a lot of schools, they're steeped in tradition and they want to highlight kids from yesteryear. And I understand why that there's value to that. But if I don't actually see myself in that space, then, then what does that matter? Right. Then it's like, it's basically, I'm just going to be there temporarily. What yeah. happens if there's a demographic shift yeah. in, in that area? Well, the, the, one, the one school um, in Edmonton area, I, I always remember, and I used to go in there as a referee. And one of the cool things when I ref uh, basketball was I would get to, I would actually walk in, and this was as when I was a principal at the same time, I would walk in all these different schools and I could tell a lot about, I'm like, ooh, I saw it at this school, we're stealing that, right? We're taking that idea. And one of the schools that um, I always remember, it was actually called Jasper Place. And it was amazing because you walked in the school and it was everything on the walls at the time that I was there was actually created and decorated by students Perfect. currently at the time. Right. So it was, it was like, it was very, um, and I, I don't know if the term is modern, but the reason I'm using the term modern is because it was the kids in the school at the time. Right. Perfect. Not like a modern in the architecture sense, but it was relevant to the kids. Yeah. yeah. And, and so you would go, and so I would go there. And, and then I would go ref and then I'd go ref there a month and a half later and stuff on the walls would actually change. 
And so part of it too was that they just didn't decorate at the beginning of the year. It was constant. But I actually asked, I'm like, this is like amazing. Who does this? So actually all like our students actually put all this stuff together. And now there is a pride and ownership um, in the school. And I remember like, I just remember going there and I could feel, it was like really interesting because I could feel the pride of the kids. Like they were so proud to be a part of that school. And I remember actually talking to one kid and saying like, this is the best, like I love it being here. And I thought about how that ownership was really crucial to that experience, right? Because a lot of times it's like, uh, hey, we believe in collaboration, but look at the, here's all the individual awards, right? And it's like, okay, so there's a, there's a mismatch, right? Um, we loved our kids right now, but look at all the kids that were here a long time ago. Right. And, and I, like I said, I, I understand honoring, um, you know, some of the stuff that we we've done and honoring tradition, but it's not helping your kids right now in many cases. Right. No. And you're, what you just described is, uh, one of the easiest ways to have a culturally relevant and culturally responsive school culture is tear down any of the posters that are submitted or, 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 um, uh, provided by the publishers. And, and only put representations of your current students up on the walls. And I don't mean like, okay, all the students who got an A, we're gonna put your A papers up on the wall. That, that, right. that's, that, that's, that's the eye candy garbage. I'm talking about like, what is aligned with your cultural identity that you're okay with contributing to the school so it becomes part of the school culture, the school environment. And it, it's to your point, it's why I mentioned earlier uh, which again, maybe another podcast is the whole idea around the mirrors and windows and sliding glass doors, which was a, 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 a mind, mindset, mindful concept developed by Dr. Rudin Sims Bishop, who's at the Ohio State University. If I, if I create representations of myself, that's the mirror. If I see that in other students who do or even sometimes do not share my same cultural identity, that's the window. If I see representations of someone who is a classmate, a teammate, or a close friend of mine that I didn't know, and then I can follow up and say, hey, I saw you put this on there. I didn't even know you could do that kind of thing. Now that serves as a sliding glass door because now I can immerse myself into, uh, into their uh, perspective on things or their cultural identity. And, and I think ultimately, look, even with what you just shared, if you're doing a rotation, it's not that hard to do it. You don't have to worry about anything beyond just, and it doesn't have to be a competition. You mentioned mm -hmm. collaboration. I will share, I think you and I might've talked about this uh, before, but I always tell people, if you're pushing for a collaboration, then that means you eliminate competition because the two are diametrically opposed. So if you do class ranking, but you want collaboration, then you got to get rid of one or the other and you got to accept that you can't have both. Mm -hmm. I'll give an example. If I know, if you and I are in school together, and I know that our high school is doing a class ranking and I got to compete against you for that class ranking to get into college, there is absolutely no way I'm going to want to work with you. Mm -hmm. In fact, if I really want to play the game, I'm actually going to try to sabotage because then it benefits me. Right. And that's not, that's not the type of environment that we would want um, in our schools. But, but I love that. I mean, I, I've seen that at a number of schools that I've been to and worked with where the representations on the walls are mm -hmm. student, student focused, student centered, student produced. And here's the key. It's not a competition like an art contest. It's we want this to be a museum of representations of our students. Well, they, the, so when I actually went to Jasper Place and I can't remember where I wasn't like, I remember it impacted me when I was a principal because when I walked into the school that I was principal of early, what I noticed is that as soon as you walk in, picture of every single principal that ever served there, right? Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you, no one cared. Like nobody cared. Um, I, I didn't care and I was the principal. And nobody was like, oh wow, that, that was a principal in 72. Like nobody cares. And so I actually, we got rid of that and we took, and basically we went to, we got frames from Ikea we get like active pictures of kids. It costs us like 20 bucks, like per picture to blow up and we put them up for two months. And the change in demeanor when people walked into our building, and I'm not just talking to the kids, I'm talking to the adults too. Right. They felt that right away. And nobody was like, oh, but we really miss those picture, those principal pictures, right? And when I, and it's not my quote, and but I use it all the time and I share it, is that tradition is peer pressure from dead people. And I think this is a, <laughs> I think it's the funniest quote. That's true. Okay, we have like, we have gone, this might be a two-parter. I don't know if we're gonna have to split this in two parts. Sorry. But this is the last thing I'm gonna ask you. So just really short, you know, all the stuff is going down with uh, pandemic. People are really, you know, 
kind of going through the struggle. Um, we're seeing some, you know, things that we've got to shift, obviously. What is like the best like piece of advice you give to people right now? Self-care. Yeah. Self-care, period. Have compassion for yourself. Disconnect when you have to. Don't be too hard on yourself, which is aligned with self-compassion. In fact, uh, I, I can send it to you. I recommend uh, folks take a, a self-compassion quiz. I do it every week um, because it helps keep you grounded in not being too hard on yourself, having compassion for yourself, because ultimately, if I have compassion for myself and I'm taking care of myself, I can better serve others as well. Self-care. That's my default. Yeah, I think, I think that's, you know, that's, um, we were talking before the podcast that if you do not take care of that, then it's really hard to help others. Correct. Right. So Ken, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Ah, we're done. That was awesome. <laughs> that was awesome. That was thank that hour or so, yeah, um, which is, we, I told you we were like, Hey, 30 minutes, but we'll probably go over. So oh, good, man. I, Ken, I appreciate it, bro. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much for all you do. Thank you. You know, I appreciate your friendship and I love every time we get a chance to talk. Yeah, thank you, man. Everyone, make sure you connect with Ken. He is incredible um, human being, incredible educator and and someone I really admire. So thank you again, my friend. Thank you. Love you, bro. Take care, man. All right.